Oh, he must have went to the restroom. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right. We'll be yes. Guys able to hear me? yes, I heard you. All right, guys. We're waiting for some people to get in. All right. Hi, how are you? Good. 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 I'm sorry, I didn't know that I'm class here. Yeah, I'm a very good one. I'm a very good guy. But I want to finish the class in my book. Mine's more biblical. Mine's English, yours is Arabic. Yeah. Yeah, we'll help her. That's amazing. She reads right from the notes of. Uh... Any, no explanation of anything? I don't know. Let's try it if you ain't know. Because we're going to be, we're doing on the Sermon on the Mount today, and we're doing the Al Qaeda. Hi, hello, 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 how are you, Jay? How are you? This is Luke. I couldn't make it in today. I'm sorry. Well, I'm on, you on, online. Yes, I am. Thank you. It was a big one today because we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, wait five more minutes. Then wait. No short. No, there's people so. Mm -hmm. Paris is coming out a few minutes late. Peter said he's on his way. I had waters today. I didn't have water. I had water. Oh. Because Peter tried to find water yet last week. Oh, thank you. Did your son sell his restaurant yet? He's uh, they're buying him out. Had that then. They're buying him out. Yeah. Same price we're buying him. Oh, yeah. What is it? He makes it. Someone wrong. What is he going to do then? Uh, he said he's going to work for some money for a little while and take the stand and wants to make a good decision. Oh. Oh, that's good. Is he thinking he's still a retail? No, he likes to retail business. He doesn't like restaurant business. It's more real. Just waiting a few more people coming in, and we'll start. What? All right. I promise I won't ask any questions. Not like I can be safe. That's the way. That's the way. I love this expression. Garment of the Yeah, I mean, this is just beautiful. Beautifully said. How old are children? Oh, 11, 10, 8, 7. Oh, so not even high school yet. No. You just look a lot older than our baby. We're in your 40s, right? Yeah. Don't worry. It creeps on 
Thank you. Anyways, I'm just not going to put it this one. We saw six, seven, five. <laughs> five would be great. Yeah. Who the hell eats with the So, uh, most of all, when they have a flea, we get a high Yeah, they just take them. No, it was just with cream. I'll tell you my daughter, she won that one. She won one of them. That's a, see, that's the only reason why. <laughs> you take less soon. Thank you. Thank you. You got a point there. Yeah. <laughs> so I was saying, though, with the thirst for water, we go in there and he goes, Alice, that's all I got is one for Tons of it, too. <laughs> Then he called me up on the way on, on, on my way home. And he's, he, he can't even talk because he's laughing so hard. Oh, what was that funny about the wood cream? But I couldn't take the call because I was on the phone with my wife. I wasn't doing that. Yeah. Sorry, let's do the next one. Okay. I have my session too, huh? Yeah. Okay, we're ready to start. And there's a lot of we need a lot more people on that. Uh Joe, uh, Steve said he was coming. Maybe he's coming in a few minutes. In the name of the Father and of the Son. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're gonna uh, today is uh I want to wish you guys a happy feast day. I don't know why they didn't mention the Chaldean, right? Today's the feast of St. Matt. As we're doing the Sermon on the Mount, today is this feast day. Okay. So we're reading on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel. We're going to start on uh, chapter 5, and we're going to read the Beatitudes. <clears throat> Seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men rival you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. The gospel of our Lord. Okay. By the way, I just uh, a little, a small uh, note here that it says that Jesus sat down and when he be began to teach, um, all people that had any kind of stature or uh, were rabbis or, you know, were elderly always did not teach standing up. Jewish custom, they would they would teach sitting down. So clearly Matthew puts Jesus as a as a high teacher. And one of the main things in Matthew's gospels is that he's a divine teacher who will teach us and give us the blueprint. Now the Sermon on the Mount is exactly what it is. It's the blueprint. of how to be a disciple of Christ, how to live as a person in grace, how to be a child of God. We're going to get the blueprint from the divine teacher's mouth himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. A few uh, key terms before we dive into that, all right? 
and very important that we that you're going to see these, uh, especially early on. Okay. The word kingdom used uh, pretty frequently in uh, Matthew's gospel. Matter of fact, the word kingdom appears 50 times. 50 times in Matthew's gospel alone. And what do you think kingdom means? What do you think? I just want to shout out. Because there's a special way that, that Matthew interprets it. Paris. Well, he calls it the kingdom of God. Kingdom. What? what, what I mean, you can say anything. The church. No, that comes later. And, uh, you know, from the way, from word calling. Kada. I mean, it has more than one meaning. Yeah. So but Matthew has a specific kingdom, meaning for it. Kingdom God in heaven, kingdom on earth. Uh, you know, well, let me go back a step and say the, what exactly what, what John the Baptist says. The kingdom of God is at hand. Does that give you a hint? The kingdom. Huh? Amen. A plus. Amen. Amen and A plus. For Matthew, it truly refers to the reign of God is at hand. This is fulfilling what, what John the Baptist says. And if he says the reign of God is at hand, then it's Jesus. Jesus is the kingdom. The reign of God, Jesus, is at hand. And another point that, say, Matthew is going to make, either you're going to choose to be in his kingdom or Satan's kingdom. There is no other, there's no in-between. And it's going to be pretty clear in Matthew's gospel that we're going to have that choice. Either we're going to be in the kingdom of God, or we're going to be in the king, or we're going to choose to be the kingdom of Satan. And no in-between. It refers to the reign of God. And exactly what John the Baptist says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Wouldn't that be the total Christ and the church? Because be told, I didn't hear you. What was that? Doesn't that mean Christ? When we ask questions, pick it up so they can hear you. Doesn't that mean Christ and the church? Because a kingdom is not just a kingdom by itself, and you have the the ministers, and you have that, and so mm -hmm. with the kingdom of God at hand means Christ, apostles. Their disciples and the church altogether is the kingdom of God at hand. No, it's only referred. To, it's only referred to Christ. Christ is the one and only King. The church is His. Right, but the kingdom yeah. to be complete. Yeah. No, we're gonna. The reign of God will complete it. The church is a gift. The sacraments are gifts. They give us God, but the kingdom is God. Let me tell you something. One time, uh, uh, and it's kind of a little bit of a sad story. Uh, I was invited to uh, somebody who had come uh, from Iraq, and he was related to my mom. And there was a bunch of people there, maybe 20, 30 people. Now, I kind of remember it was a day, one of the, uh, not the Columbia, but one of the, the one with the head of, uh, 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 no, one of the spacecrafts, yeah. But it wasn't that one. It was a later one. I think we, they had a Jewish astronaut and he died and his dad was, you know, was on television like a real old man. But anyways, I remember specifically for that day, he asked me, he goes, uh, I don't know how the conversation was. Somebody said, uh, EJ knows scripture or something, you know, he goes, you know, and I said to him, well, where do you want me? Where do you want? What are you asking me? Like you you want physical I, know. Ordinance I said, do you want me to tell you? Come on, the, the Google Earth. I said, do you want a theological answer or do you want from an, you know, something to make you feel good answer? You know, yeah. yeah. I said to him, the kingdom of God is God. It's in God. We're taken into God into heaven. I'm not saying there is not a place, but I'm saying the fullness of it is that we're in God. And he clearly says that when I want to gather, you know, like a hen gathers her chicks. So that's a very important thing to put aside before we get into, you know, the teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. Another, 
Courtney, yes. Can you say that uh, the kingdom of heaven is a state of mind now that we haven't kind of crossed over to the other side, if you will? In, in other words, more than mind, I, I you know, more, more metaphysical, you know, it's real, but yet it's, 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 it's metaphysical, you know, more than just yeah, it's internal, right? It's internal. Uh, so in feeling that union within oneself is that kingdom when you reach that point where you're sort of um i think the saints probably had a, a better um intuition about this and, and the way they live their lives where they were they've given um they've given total submission to god and they become they have that union so to them you know for us we haven't reached that point i mean i can speak for myself but uh is that perfect close, union not about sad but you're pretty close <laughs> um, it's all work in progress right? right exactly the kingdom is is the reign of god which is jesus uh and we know jesus when we said today in our little coffee thing that there's a hypostatic union he's fully god and fully man so so we you know and and we also know that jesus never divorced his body he glorified it and and loved humanity so much that he took it to heaven with him. So uh, the kingdom of God is in God. Are we going to have a place that, you know, that they're like the, the book of Revelation says where there's no warning? I hope so. But that will still be in God. I know one thing. It's sure not a material world that the Islamic people believe in. I'm, I know that. Where we have so many virgins and so much carnal pleasures, you know, we're going to have infinite pleasure. So another word that I want to hit on, really important to get a meaning down for you guys, is repent. Metamoya in Greek. Okay, and there's many ways to look at it. All right. Um, it appears a number of times in, the old, in uh, Matthew's especially in Matthew, but throughout the uh, New Testament. Yes, it means that you are sorry. That's the start of it, but that's not all. Another part that St. Matthew, and we're going to find out, is recognition. I am not what I'm supposed to be. Repent also means I am not what I'm supposed to be. Not yet. And the Greek part of it, the metamoia, is calls for a, a challenge to change of old self to new self. And the fruits of repenting is when you know you repented, you can call God Father. And then you become a child of God. So when John the Baptist, now let's put all this, when John the Baptist says repent, he means you're sorry. He means you know you can be better than you are, what you're doing right now. And you owe it to yourself if you're going to repent to change, to make yourself anew. And when you do that, you call God Father and you become a child of God. So actually, it's a forerunner to, to when we really repent in baptism. Why is the forgiveness of sins? And by the way, I did, if you're in a class, I'll give one to Mike, uh, uh, to Steve to, uh, to get to you. I uh, printed up and made copies. Uh, Elias made copies. Uh, the baptism of, uh, by, uh, let's read it one more time. It's so important. By St. Gregory of Nazianza. Baptism is God's most beautiful and magnific magnificent gift. We call it gift because of grace, anointing, enlightenment, garment of immortality, bath of rebirth, seal, and most precious gift. It is called gift because it is confirmed on those who bring nothing of their own. Grace since it is given even to the guilty. Baptism because sin is buried into the water. Anointing for its priestly and royal as those who are anointed. Enlightenment because it radiates light. Clothing, since it reveals our shame. 
bath because it washes and seals us. It is our guard and the sign of God's lordship. Now, when we add repent, prepare for that, it makes a lot of sense. I think the question is, yes. All this is not, let's say a guy that's not, uh, yes, he's getting in. And his sole purpose of, is he a Christian? Yeah, not that nice. No, because he couldn't be a Christian. I don't understand. He's not a Christian. Uh, he becomes Christian, or is he Christian, but he's falling away from, and, and he's getting married. So for the purpose of the marriage, he accepts to be baptized. Does the baptism requires the reciprocal work from the other end, or is it one sided? Like the God is going to bless you regardless of what you thought on. That's a really good question. He's saying, is somebody coming into marriage and using the sacrament of baptism for his benefit? He wants to end up with marrying this lady, and her father says, unless you become a Catholic or a Greek, Right. You cannot come into the church, you know, like my, you know, that movie, right. that my uh, Greek uh, wedding, what yeah. was it called? Yeah, my, Greek. I mean, how can big huh? fat Greek wedding yeah, or something? The child, and the guy got knowing the they do step, we step on their behalf. So, why is the mind, this is the mind, the possible decision? Why does it make a difference in the gift? No, I don't know. I'm but is it, is, I'm but it. But the question is this is an adult, and is he using the sacraments? For not for what they're not, you have to have, you know, you have to have a a. And you have to be baptized to marry this person, right? Yeah. Does that take away? Does that is that an invalid sacrament? Because we're not. It gets done for you. It's, it's a, a sacrament would be valid. Sacrament is valid. Okay. It's valid. Okay. Not be valid. Yeah. No, the sacrament is valid. Yeah. The sacrament is absolutely valid. Yeah. But it goes back to you. Only God knows. Exactly. You can only lie. God. You can lie mean, to the church, but you cannot lie to God at the end. Exactly. But the sacrament What's your? Valid. There's a lot of baptized people are going to end up in hell. And, no. Okay, we have a question. Can I say something before? Uh, uh, as, uh, well, let's as let the uh, people on the, on the internet talk. Yes, who is this? Uh, I think I listen a lot to Patrick Madrid, and when he answered this kind of question, he said, you could marry a Catholic, you don't have to be baptized, but you have to promise the church the kid will will be yeah, Catholic. Children will be baptized. Yeah, yeah but we're yeah. not. He's getting at. Can you use baptism for your own benefit? Let me up the a little bit, and this guy gets baptized and then he dies. Yeah. Uh, baptism does not. His baptism. Is, his, well, yes, it does. Yeah. No, really his baptism not. would be valid, but it would be illicit yeah. because he, in his heart, was using. But maybe, maybe he had an act of contrition in the last second. We don't yeah, know. We don't know, but but based on. Now we're going to move on to another word. Yeah. And I have a question about uh, last week. Uh, I, I have to hear the people on the internet. Go on. Yes. I'm sorry. What's the difference between baptism and confession? A big difference. You can't. A baptism is is the first of all of the initiating. You know, sacraments. The initiating mm -hmm. sacraments are. Baptism, confirmation, and reconciliation. I mean, excuse me, communion, the Eucharist. All right, now you're talking about reconciliation. Now, when you're baptized and you and you're washed from your original sin, confession does not wipe away wipe out original sin. When now you're no longer a pagan, you're a child of God, you come into the church. If you happen to fall, you still got the forgiveness of sin, but now. You have broken away, you know, you need to repent and go back. And so God offers us another avenue to get back in grace. There's a big difference, okay? Reconciliation is a sacrament, okay, that keeps our baptismal promise alive. Once you have done away with the original sin, you're a child of God, but that doesn't mean you're going to live as a child of God because that's when we're going to get into the blueprint when we do the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you. Now, another very important word is blessed. Makorius in Greek. And this is very important. 
It literally means to be favored by God. Favored in God's grace. It has a far greater meaning than being happy. And some very bad translations of scripture says, starts off the Beatitudes with the word happy. Incorrect. That's not the word in Greek. It's being favored in God's grace. Favored in, by God. It has a far greater meaning, way more important meaning than happy. It is found 13 times in Matthew's gospel and 37 times in the New Testament. Blessed, favored are those who love God. Blessed, favored are those whose sins are forgiven. This is just me using. Blessed, favored are those who have faith in God and obey his covenant, do his will. Now let's put that if we would have put happy. Happy are those who love God. So, you know, well, how would you define it? So, you know, when something is just plain and it has no meaning. Well, they are, they are often just happy. Your person is happy. They're, God is making you feel. Well, we have translations in some scripture that say happy. Yeah. And I'm just pointing out, blessed is You're a right. far greater yeah. terminology yeah. Than, yeah. than happy. More friends friends like blessed than happy. That's what happens yeah. Okay. But to be favored by God, by the government. Yeah. Okay, with that being said, I want to uh, read from uh, my own book. How about that? I'm going to read from my own because I did my thesis on the Our Father, especially from Matthew's Gospel. I did mention Luke's. Okay. And this is where we're going, before we go into the second half of the class, we're going to just break it down, okay? The Sermon on the Mount is the first of five major discourses in Matthew's Gospel. So Matthew's Gospel, when you come to discourse, it has five of them. The Sermon on the Mount is the first one. It contains some of Jesus' most profound teachings on Christian discipleship. It's very clear that the Sermon on the Mount Discourse has a wealth of information, and this section, okay, this section will, will give us the blueprint and how to live a Christian Catholic life as a child of God, as a disciple of God. And we're all called to be disciples. We're all called to be disciples. We're all called to be saints, and it's going to give us the divine teacher, our Lord Jesus, is going to give us the means of how to do this. I want to do, before we can go in there, we got to look at first century Palestine. Because we got to kind of get a grasp of it. The Jewish people in Jesus' day, in Matthew, sets the stage. All right? He highlights that Jesus is the divine teacher. And many of these teachings that Jesus gives to the disciples, words emphasize the Father's will to unlock the mysteries of the kingdom. So there you have it. A lot of Jesus' teaching is going to unlock, unlock the mysteries of the kingdom. And we said the kingdom is the reign of God. Now, one thing that we, we must adhere to, we must learn that Jesus did not come to give us a brand new moral code. He clearly says, I didn't come to take one iota, one dot of the law away. That was not his mission to come to give us a new moral code. A lot of people say, oh, we don't need the Ten Commandments no more. We have the Beatitudes. We have to just be people who, you know, who are you know, doing lovely things. No. What Jesus is going to come and teach us, and he does teach us on the Sermon on the Mount, is that the Ten Commandments were not a bunch of were not a bunch of do's and do nots. Well, they, they were, but but the Beatitudes tell you they tell you what not to do, but the Beatitudes tell you how to live, right? No, yes, yes, and no. The attitudes bring the Ten Commandments clearly into life. Right. They become a bunch of love. 
love. Becomes too They're an order of love. Yeah. Because when we start talking about the Beatitudes, and we're going to talk about them, I keep on saying we're going to talk about them, but we got to get through the introduction to them. Okay. You're going to find out that when you love God with all your heart, all your mind, you know, the Beatitudes are going to, are going to come together and infuse with the Ten Commandments, how to live the Ten Commandments without being burdens. That's why Jesus can tell you in Matthew's gospel, a few chapters down the road, you know, my burden is light. My yoke is not hard. It's not going to strain you down. I have a beautiful, merciful heart. So, he did not come, but rather to ch challenge us to live according to divine love, which Israel misunderstood, how to live in divine love. A, a, a very good a theologian, Daryl Block, he says of this, the depth of the Sermon on the Mount has produced a variety of views beyond the recognition that is reflects Jesus' ethical standards for his disciples. The sermon defies classification, but most of the sermon reflects a proper response to God's invitation to enter humbly into the blessing of the kingdom relationship as offered in the Beatitudes. In short, if one is to be light, then he must be the light. <clears throat> you know, and, and uh, Block is talking about the parable where Jesus says, you do not put you know, a light under the bushel. And Block says, if you live according to the beatitude, you're going to become the light. And, and the Jews never wanted to become a light to the nations. For some reason, they rejected that. They didn't want to introduce God to the nations. Okay, let's talk about the audience in Jesus' time. Of course, we want to study the Our Father. We want to study the the parables, which we're going to do. We want to study, you know, transfiguration, which I want to cover. Got to know something about the people. You got to remember, first century Palestine, I'm going to call this a first century Palestine, was immersed in a unique and troubling time. Their country was governed and occupied by a foreign power, Rome. Even though the Romans indirectly ruled Palestine and supported a limited self-government, Palestine was under Roman supremacy from 63 BC to 70 AD. Okay, a little over 100 years. And they divided it mostly in three areas. Or you could say, you could say five by three because they split up one part of it. The first area they divided would be the southern, would be the treachery of Antipas. Then the treachery of Philip and the rule of Archelaus in Judea, which later becomes the rule of Pontius Pilate, the Roman proctor during the, our Lord Jesus' ministry, death and resurrection. Pilate is believed to have governed Judea from 626 to 36 AD. The other two provinces were ruled by Herod's sons and basically puppet rulers, either to Rome or to their dad. Now we want to divide who are, who are the people in, in Jesus' time. The people who followed or knew about Jesus were not only apostles and disciples anywhere between 27 and 30 AD, the three-year period of his ministry. They were from various walks of life. The first people we'll categorize is the Galileans who were not at all wealthy and were scattered a living for, and they struggled for a living. They scratched out a living. They weren't dirt poor. We're not talking about, you know, you know the, the, the poor in Calcutta. They scratched out a living. They were not by far wealthy. And these are the Northern people. Matter of fact, they had a little bit of a different dialect. The Southern people would look, look down on them as undereducated and made fun of their dialect. What was the relationship between the kings like Herod and Caesar, the emperor? How, what was the the, you'd go through the Roman, it wasn't too good. I mean, it was a lot of, uh, you know, I would use him for this purpose and they would use him for this purpose. Yeah. Um, but he didn't 
First of all, the Jewish people never expected the, you know, Herod's kingdom because he was an Edomite. He was not a real 100% thoroughbred Jew, you know. So they never liked him anyways. And, and, and they never, and they thought he was weak because he was always given into, they used each other. But basically he was a puppet government for Rome. All right, Rome let him you know, sustain his kingdom, but for their purpose. You know, Roma, Rome had, uh, you know, a rule, I know, uh, of uh, authority by, uh, you know, of heavy taxation, you know, keeping the place relatively safe from war, being attacked from other nations, keeping uh, a lot of the own uh, criminals out, you know, having a strong army. And they would let you live in relatively peace as long as they reap their reward by overtaxation, stealing what they wanted. No different than today. Others were wealthy, such as Lazarus and, and his sister. There were a few, you know, it wasn't all poor. We know that, um, uh, that Lazarus was rich. We know the story of the, a rich, uh, the other Lazarus, not the good Lazarus was rich, who had Martha and Mary, but we also know that the story of Lazarus who, who died, you know, Lazarus. so there were rich people. And we know that they were masters who, you know, who owned the land who gave it to their servants to run. So it wasn't totally, you know, a poor nation. The Pharisees, this is an important one, the separated one, Precia, they were very popular. They had great influence over the people. You could say that they were like a modern day athlete, you know, that people liked them. People really favored them, said, wow, this is a Pharisee. And they had great grasp of exterior knowledge of the Mosaic law. They thought they were better. But they lacked essential knowledge of God's love and mercy. And then you have the Sadducees and scribes, the priestly, aristocrats, very wealthy. Consider themselves the educated elite. They thought they were even smarter than the Pharisees. One thing I want to point out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, life after death. The Sadducees did not. And Paul would use that in his trials you know, uh, in a very way that would benefit him and go to be judged in Rome. They were not liked. The Sadducees and scribes were not liked. They did not share in the popularity of the Pharisees because many Jews believed that they collaborated with Rome. They gave in to Rome to stay in power. And then you have the Essenes as aesthetic Jewish religious group existing in the time of the New Testament believed that the Sanhedrin and the temple worship had become impure and corrupt. Some were celibates, but not all. Some people think they were awesome who did not marry and withdrew to the Qumran region, a region that is near the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. Now, some people say, well, John the Baptist could have been a scene. And uh, Father Dave agreed with me uh, yesterday that he says he was not. He had similar traits, but he was not in the scene. Well, where did he go when he took him to the New World? No one's supposed to. Yeah. How did he survive him? So, John the Baptist? Yeah. yeah. We don't know what age that he left to go to the desert, but what is the desert? What is the desert? I don't know. You want to go see No, I'm not talking about the physical desert. It's an emptiness. In the wilderness. Wasn't the desert, was it? Huh? Well, he ate locusts. The wilderness over there is considered the one and the same. The wilderness and the desert in the New Testament are one and the same. After 40 days, Jesus went into the wilderness, the desert, to fast. And then you had the zealots. And now you got to remember one thing about the zealots. Zealots were more prominent after Jesus. They were just starting off. Uh, they weren't as organized as you think during. I know we have Simon the Zealot, one of the, the apostles. But they weren't as organized. But they were a group of people starting off to be a revolutionary group who wanted to physically overthrow Rome. 
they became much more organized and more powerful after the death of Jesus and his resurrection. So not being And then we have the Samaritans and Gentiles who were foreigners who did not know God or God's ways, non-Jews. The Samaritans who lived in first century Palestine were extremely disliked. You talk about racism, you talk about a dislike between people. Yeah, I don't think there was a higher one between Jews and Samaritans. And the reason is because the Jews felt that these were our brothers who defaulted us, who married Assyrians, you know, who spit on the law, who spit on their customs. Uh, they really disliked it from intermarrying with non-Jews, the Assyrians. They were believed to be impure, the worst rubbish of them all. Because even Gentiles, they felt were, were, were more welcoming because they didn't, they didn't have the knowledge. They didn't know God. And they thought that they gave everything up to intermarry with, with the Syrians. However, Jesus shows great compassion for both the Gentiles and the Samaritans throughout the New Testament. He shows great compassion. And you're going to find out when we talk about the woman at the well, when I talk about John's gospel, that he went out of his way to go to Samaria. Samaria. And I know you, you, you'll see that in the, in the chosen. But I told that to a, a priest at Brother Rice when he came and asked me, because, you know, I have a hard time with this. And I told him that there was other routes to avoid going to, through Samaria. You'd have to go around, go mountain, a little bit more harder way that most Jewish people traveled from you know, Cana, Galilee, back into Jerusalem for the festivals because they want, they want nothing to do with the Samaria. But Jesus chose the heart of the route to go there because he wanted to include them in his ministry. Which is uh, really pretty profound. And it's also portrayed in the Chosen. Now, very important, Matthew portrays Jesus also as the new Moses, the greater Moses. Very important, he depicts Jesus appearing in the mountain seven times. Seven times Jesus is found on the mountain, communicating, teaching of great importance. And I'm not going to go after all the mountains, but I got them listed here, okay? And we're going to find out that Jesus teaches with more authority than Moses. In Matthew, the writing for the Jewish Christian community, remember, implicitly shows that Jesus parallels Moses' experience on Mount Sinai. Matthew presents Jesus as the new Moses who fulfills the Mosaic law with agape, radical self-sacrificing love. I remember when I told you Hesed love, when we are in the Old Testament, it turns into agape love. Jesus clearly teaching us with unfamiliar authority in this section. Pope Benedict, when he was Pope Benedict XVI, talks about Jesus teaching authority as follows. Jesus sits down, the expression of plenary authority of a teacher. Jesus not only exhibits authority, but truly com completed and transcended Moses' teaching on the law as the true son of God. Jesus did not undermine the law, but rather fulfilled it by adding his infinite love and mercy, thus making them a necessary for Christian life, a necessity. He simply wanted the Mosaic law to become alive. That's what I said <clears throat> earlier, the 10 commandments to come alive to the believer. No longer being dead external works, but true and living works that are based on one's interior life. Therefore, the Sermon on the Mount cries out once again that this Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. When John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to even untie his sandals. Any questions? 
it's good to get kind of a little setting about because we're talking about Matthew's gospel. We ask Matthew Matthew to intercede for us to better understand. Do we see that Matthew is praying, portraying Jesus as a divine teacher? Matthew portraying Jesus as the new Moses, one who's going to fulfill the law. Any questions about that? And it was important to discuss a little bit about the Pharisees, the Sadducees. You know. If this is the location of the, the sermon, yeah. Was that by the entire sermon? I have it in here, but I don't want to go back and look. But it's one of the seven mountains, yeah. It was on a mountain. When I went to Jerusalem, I thought there was a church to me there. And just, yeah. That's where the, that was by the river. Yeah. So I don't know if that was just I'm making up stuff or. Like, no, it probably was. But let me let me say one thing, Peter. I'll get to you in one second. Okay, I just want to bring this up. When I was a teacher in high school, you know, I was not in a, sometimes in a great situation because God bless him. I pray for him. the priest didn't believe in too much miracles. One Jesus, and I know that the chosen. That's why I disagree with it. He didn't have an itinerary where. It, the Holy Spirit led him to, to preach is where he was going to preach. That's one thing I don't like about I, at the end of the, they're, you know, they're getting it together and they're going to give out itineraries to come meet him at this mountain. That didn't happen. And one thing is that this priest was saying that everybody, you know, when he's, we were talking about the multiplication of loaves, which is going to be like, that everybody had a piece of fish, everybody had a piece of loaf, and they all sat down and Jesus blessed them and everybody had an open heart to to uh, share their food with one another. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. First of all, common coolers were not around when Jesus was around. So people didn't come around with a picnic. You know, and they didn't, you know, if you, you know, were going around like with Jesus' disciples, they had a few loaves of bread, a few fish. Not even Yeah, no. <laughs> and he didn't have an itinerary and people didn't come around, you know, saving the fish and keep them preserved. I know they preserved them with salt to feed that many people. The miracle was not about sharing. It's a miracle that Jesus, without, you know, earthly, you know, logic, multiplied the fish and the loaves. Don't go that route. Always trying to prove that, you know, we don't need miracles. Jesus was, no, Jesus used miracles because he shows that he's beyond the laws of nature. Amen? Amen. You know, I got some heated arguments. I know, yeah, there was a piece of Bible by ACLC yeah. from Iraq mm -hmm. that said exactly what you said yeah. about the miracles are not important. Mm -hmm. say it on the, uh, yeah, you can say that there's more importance than miracles, but you cannot say that they didn't, you know, they didn't happen. Like one time they came out and said, you know, you know how Jesus walked on water? Actually, the water turned on ice and he was walking on ice. And I said to him, are you people crazy? I wanted to call this radio station. When does it freeze in the Middle East? What's the matter with you? Only that day. Yeah. When does the water have to turn to 32 degrees and for a certain amount of period, you know, and the, and, you know, the cup. Anyway? Yeah, uh, and the same day. The same day. So either he walked on the yeah. water or Jesus froze the water. They go beyond. Ways and means to try to prove their point, and they're all wrong. Yeah. He was born of a yes, sir. You, when we start talking about Matthew, you, yeah. you mentioned there's five discourses in Matthew. Mm -hmm. Major first, discourse. There's a lot of discourse, but major. Oh, okay. You said the first one was the sermon on the yeah. Is it gonna be are, you, are there others? Yeah. Or, or are you gonna? You didn't cover those yet. So no. Okay. 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 Also, the, I read, and I don't know how true that is, that this happened towards the end of Christ's ministry, but Matthew put it in the beginning because of its importance. Is that true? Or? You know, I don't know how he compiled, but what I do know, and it's a very important, that the synoptics are one-year cycles of Jesus' ministry, all put together. Here was a three-year cycle. We know that. I just read the three years that were Jesus preached. But 
if we look chronologically, the synoptics only use one year. But we know John's gospel uses three years distinctively. Three separate trips to Jerusalem. So we know that. Um, but I, I, I don't know the, you know, we don't know exactly, you know, where, you know, this took place in his ministry. Luke, by the way, just to put it out there, does not have a sermon on the mount. Okay, he has a sermon on the plain and there are four uh, uh, blessings and four woes. You have nine Beatitudes where Luke has four blessings and four woes. And some people would say, well, you know, that, that's the same sermon. One's on a plane, one's on a... No, I'm not on that school. There are two different sermons. And when you are, you know, a coach, and you're always teaching your players to continue doing this, you know, you might be using the same play and, can, and continue teaching on that play for a different game. It worked. So Jesus had the Sermon on the Mount and also had the Sermon on the Plain and reinforced it. Reinforced it. Why do people have to go out of their way and say, oh, this was the same thing? Matthew, Matthew has nine Beatitudes where, where Luke has four blessings and four wolves. I always thought it was eight. I didn't realize there was nine Beatitudes. There are nine. It is nine. Yeah. yeah. Nine okay, why don't we take a quick five minute break right now because we're going to get into the Beatitudes and then and we're going to go right into the Beatitudes. Take a five, quick five minutes, get a glass of water. Okay. Maybe a three, four minute break if you guys have. Yeah, five through seven, but then he doesn't need Matthew till nine or ten. So what you're saying is, did he just. So you can't take Matthew's gospel in chronological order. No. Just, unless Matthew wasn't there. In Matthew's gospel, he only has uh, Simon and Andrew as the apostles, and then it goes into the Sermon on the Mount. So you can't take his... You know that book, The Parallels? Look at it. You, know you can't I mean? take that in... The you're going to take Matthew's gospel in chronological order. That's probably what you're saying. Correct. Right. Yeah. So then go to what you said. Correct. Like, he put it in there... But it really based has on based on to to borrow that my, uh, my book, The Parallels, because I was looking for it the other day. I don't know if I put it somewhere in my house. Parallels, you weren't here though. That's, I remember, I think. I don't know. But I don't think the Holy Spirit really cares what, what order, as long as it's there. No, I don't. You know what I, I listened to twice last week is uh, Scott on the the Lamb of it's the meal of the Lamb of God. Yeah, I, I've quoted him a lot of my times in my book. I had to listen once, but then I had to listen again. I wanted to write it down. He, he makes several oh, of those. He's into, he's into a lot of the uh, covenants. The covenant, really, yeah. Covenant yeah. And how, oh, it was and was good. how uh, like, when he talks about mm -hmm. um, okay, Revelation, the same way the Mass is broken into uh, two parts, the uh, liturgy of the Word is the whole mm -hmm. first part of Revelation. Yeah. The books, the talk, uh, you know, the, the preaching to the churches, and then yeah. the the second half of Revelation is, you know, is the uh, uh, liturgy of the Eucharist, and where, uh, you know, Jesus becomes that Lamb of God. Yep. And it's amazing how he transforms from from being a uh, Protestant to how he becomes a Catholic. Oh, uh, yeah. Scott Hahn. Yeah, I heard him say. And he always tell when I go see him sometimes when he give out gives out talks, comes to Michigan. Yeah. He always branches a little bit of his Protestantism to it, becoming Catholic. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a couple of things I've listened to. It's amazing how he talks about how uh, how he argued with. Protestant people that he went to college with, mm -hmm. 
and and how he converted them too. Yeah, it wasn't it uh, when he read by faith alone, uh, you you saved by faith, and one person told him it doesn't say alone, and that kind of threw him off. Wasn't that the story? I can't remember. It was Emerson. Uh, I think I'm not familiar with Marcus Gordon also. Yeah, he. Yeah. Stephen Ray, the founder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stephen Ray always. I didn't know this Bible is Catholic. That's what you're saying. You know, reading, mm -hmm. reading the Bible is Catholic. Yeah. 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 You're right. So the Federal Reserve raised the base three quarters, not one percent. That's what they said they're going to do. You know, I looked up the stocks in the morning. I'm like, oh, okay, they're up 100. Yeah, they're not saying they Yeah, and then and down at down. the end of the day, yeah. so I said, let's see how did it finish good. You know, mix, and then I saw 500 points. Don't worry about it, I'll come back. When we take over Congress. Yeah. I I knew it. I knew once it was tomorrow. I, I knew it. Brock, I remember my son asked me, Dad, is it gonna like get bad right away? Mm -hmm. I said, Oh no. I said a lot of what what Trump did is gonna carry over, but slowly it's gonna get it's gonna get disseminated. Stocks will go down. Interest rates are gonna go up and it I worked the world. That's all personal wealth and then but what's really bad is the, the moral decline. Well and he, and he calls himself a Catholic. Him and he sure is not living the Beatitudes. <laughs> well, you know, uh that's always declining, unfortunately. Yeah. That's what but at least some leader prevent it from becoming worse or you know. Uh, he just has made it a free-for-all that it's okay to not have morals. It's okay to not, you can just, you know. Yeah. We'll talk after class what I heard about some of that Chaldean young people doing. That was amazing. Man. All right, we're waiting for Christine. Here she is. Love you. Okay, I'll reiterate. The word beatitude comes from the Latin beatitude, meaning blessed. The beatitudes are simply the gospel of life. They are simply the gospel of life. The term blessed, again, makarios, which refers to those who are in a state of grace, those who stand in God's favor. Like I said, a lot more important than happy. Matthew's gospel gives us nine beatitudes. Nine. Remember, we differ from Luke's sermon on the plane where they have four blessings and four woes. Many people will take the beatitudes and say, look, these are just for, you know, the worldly poor. That's all Jesus is, was concerned about. And, and nothing could be farther from the truth. Okay, number one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, a lot of people will say, what do we mean? We, you know, don't look at the English translation. I went back and looked at it. It's saying, don't have a high spirit of yourself. This is not talking about the Holy Spirit. Don't be narcissistic. It's exactly what this is saying. Don't believe in yourself. You are not God. You are not the king. You are not the divine teacher. No, neither am I or nobody else. Not even the Pope. It is saying, I'll get to one second. It is saying, blessed are you. Blessed are you. Are you, you who are in favor, who don't think highly of themselves, are not put on airs. Go on, stop. Don't have pride. I love the way St. Paul says it when, he, when, when we read that beautiful reading on love. It's not pompous. It's not put on airs. 
Yeah, haughty. That's a great word. This could be interpreted as those who are willing to die to themselves also. Exactly what I said to repent, to die to yourself, to put on a new self and become humble like a child. The word child. Remember, when we read that, Jesus says, and he want to enter the kingdom when he brought a child. He said, you got to, he didn't say be childlike, childish, I mean. He said, be child. What does it mean to be child? They're pure. They're simple. They need to be taken by their hands. They need to be fed. They depend on their parents. So to be a child, we need to depend on God. Not on ourselves. Like you said, haughty. We have to be humble like a child. And when you are humble to, to a child, you're docile to the powers of the Holy Trinity. You're docile to the Holy Spirit. You are truly poor in your pride. When you're poor in your pride, you can absorb God's love. It can manifest in your heart. Remember, we, we, we pray, you know, God, take my heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. When we are poor in spirit, we can allow God to take our hardened hearts and make them hearts of flesh. It really is the only way to receive God's mercy. When you're full of yourself, you're not going to receive God's mercy. I, I have to tell you something. I heard something the other day. Really upset me. Uh, a gentleman in, in our community has cancer. He just found out that, you know, he's away from the church. And he told the person that I know, he, no, I, he goes, uh, you know, he want, you know, I want to be cremated. I don't care what happens to me. I don't want a priest. I don't want last rites. I don't want nothing. I don't want a funeral. You know, he's got it like a stage four pancreatic cancer or whatever. And I told him, I said, you know, you know, why is he so hostile to receive prayers and, and teachings of the church and receive the sacraments? What's the matter with him? You know. When we are poor in spirit, we wouldn't be hostile to God's love. How many Chaldean people are, and I and I and I I need to explain this. The church doesn't say. You can be cremated and scatter your ashes. It says if you want to be cremated, you still have to bury the ashes. Now a new thing is uh, my son was telling me that some people are, are burning the ashes and molding them into a ring so they can wear them. I, when is it gonna, that's exactly opposite of being poor in spirit. That is full of yourself. I'm not in favor of cremation anyways. I think we should... Look for the example of our Lord who was buried, and we need to be buried. That's first. I don't think the church should ever allow that, but it did, and that, that's for a different day discussion. That's my own personal view. EJ. Yes. I have a question. So, one of the meanings of this beatitude is um, when when a person kind of does the work and they don't receive any honor from others and they don't receive praise. Um, so you just do things just to do it because you want to do it. And it's not to receive praise. The, doesn't that, that go against a lot of what we do as Chaldeans when we have these fundraisers? You know, we have to put plaques of people's names and call them out on the podium and say how much they donated. So aren't we like the anti-beatitudes? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we want a pet on our back, but that's a, diff that's a pet on the back. That's, you know, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, sometimes we need to raise money and, and, and we... we, we you know, we have two different people, you know, bidding for uh, things, but uh, that's not uh, for today's class, but that's a pat on the back, and we should never be doing things for a pat on. Jesus says, you know, in, in the other sermon, he says, you know, when you give alms, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So I'll leave that at that, right? <laughs> we do need just, pats just, on the back, just, and, I, you know, not all of us are perfect, and don't think we're going to be perfect. Just one thing to cover that. Steve, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So I had a friend that received recognition for 
his donations, and he never, he, year after year, he was reluctant to do it. And then finally, he was convinced to do it. And the way he was convinced to do it was that if somebody saw him do it, would that get somebody else to do it, right? Because sometimes- yeah, That's why I said, I'm not going to get If TJ did it, I'm going to do no, it. No, I said, but we need to raise money. I said that sometimes, yeah, I'll outbid each other. That's fine. Okay. Let's not point fingers right now. I mean, we we have a lot of faults, but we have a lot of good too. I think Christ elevated that to being a little more than that. It means all of us need to be poor in spirit so we can be emptied out, die to ourselves, and receive Christ. We're not going to carry our crosses if we're not if we're believing in ourselves and being narcissistic, right? I mean, when the church started, you want to follow me. You know, carry your cross and follow me. Go on. When the church started, too, when people were selling stuff and bringing it to the church, they were not doing it in hiding because the whole church was there. People yeah. were bringing it in front of the apostles. Yeah. Okay, you know can I mean? we, yeah, you're right. But can we get off this? Because I don't want to get into personal things. Yeah. I, it's not a, you know, a thing about pat on the back. It's about dying to yourself and rising with Christ. Being poor in spirit means that you're not full of yourself. You're full of the Holy Spirit. You're in the, you, you, you know what? Let me tell you something more about this. You know how many, you know what's more important, uh, Steve? Is this people who say they're living, you know, I'm living the dream by being a life of sin. Yep. That's when you're more full of yourself. Spending all kind of money on debauchery and, you know, just like the prodigal son. All right? Yep. The second, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, this one, it, is, it does pertain to people who have lost loved ones, but it also pertains to the ones who are mourning their sinful life. They're, they don't want to live that sinful life. They hate that sinful life. He said, blessed are those who hate sin, who've turned away, who've truly repented, who've put on a new self. Who hate the sinful life that they had. Perfect example of Mary Magdalene. Perfect example. She mourned over her sins. She turned a new face. She turned to be a child of God. And she's held in the highest honor. Totally different when someone says, I don't want to receive the sacraments. I don't need anybody. I just want to go and die. There's a lot. There's an afterlife, buddy. If I could only reach him and say, you don't know how much you need the sacrament. You don't know how much you need God's mercy. We mourn for our loved ones because we are human. And we miss them. But we mostly mourn for, we want to, when we turn, our, we hate this life we, we lived. Oh, I so talked to Elias about that one time. I'll, I'll get, Steve, just let me capture this thought. Uh, a very good teacher of mine said, uh, uh, don't live in the, your past sins. Don't glorify them. Don't live in our past. Oh, uh, I used to do this. I was cool. You know what I mean? I, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I took five, six, seven grand with me to Las Vegas and, you know, and, you know, and ran a dice to, you know, sometimes that comes up, you know, when you had one, two major, but this is exactly what we have now, a new person. We're born in Christ. Go on, Steve. Go on, Steve. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know, when I see this beatitude, I always think of people who grieve, people who have been stricken by cancer, people who've lost their job, you know, people with, with terminal diseases and stuff. And I always say people like that are truly blessed because when we grieve, we understand who God is and we get closer to him. So this is, I love this beatitude because um, it's, I yeah, just you're feel right. that, it's both. Yeah. But it's yeah, also, I just feel people who grieve that they, the they're blessed says, by God. The church fathers all agree that also that we, we grieve, we, you know, we get rid of our sins, we, we mourn them, we, we don't want nothing to do with them anymore, our sinful life. That you know? is not far blind, right? Yeah. Like, look, it's the both. Guy, the guy that you mentioned now that doesn't want anything to do with it. What would you say to someone like that? That doesn't fall into any of this. We have to pray for him. 
He's a lost soul. He's a child of the devil right now. We need to pray for his soul to be in you know, some way that we, we could to put a wedge in there and, and allow God to come through. Oh, that is the answer. He's like a Jesus thing. I mean, they said something to turn the, turn the blind man. You know, he just doesn't want anything to do with God. I know Father Dave one time in a homily said that he met a person. Father Dave, by the way, is a great uh, Dominican priest at the monastery. I mentioned him a lot because he's a mentor toward me too. Yeah. He mentioned that one time in a homily that he met a person who came up to him and says, I, I'm looking forward to going to hell. Yeah. I want nothing to do with heaven. We were there to yeah. Uh, you know, and, and mind bombing. Came up to him and said, I want nothing to do. You guys are, you know. I think those people are having some pain in their heart. I don't know. I don't, I didn't know this person, but I remember I heard it in a homily. Um, number three, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek here does not at all mean a sign of weakness. It does not mean a sign of weakness, but rather one that is gentle, humble, and patient. Especially during times of persecution. The meek person is one who is fully embodied by the gospel and thirst for heaven. Blessed, our favorite are you that you are meek. There's one thing I don't have in this. I don't have no patience. <laughs> I need I still looking for that virtue. So you're not hurting. A great example of this would be St. Paul. St. Paul was far from being a weak person. Uh, matter of fact, other than Christ, he was probably the most persecuted, beaten person. S survived a number of shipwrecks, um, scourged and beaten, spit on, left to be died. Um, his own people, because he was a Pharisee, uh, really treated him bad, but yet he was meek. He was humble. He says, I, I, I have one purpose, just to preach the gospel. St. Paul? St. Paul. I just say, I just gave you an example who would be meek. Gentle, humble. St. Polycarp. St. Polycarp, uh, you know, they, they tried to burn him and kill him. He wouldn't die that way. For some reason, the fire wasn't burning him. You know, and, and, they, and they wanted him to refute his religion, his faith in Christ. He says, you know, this Christ, he's never done anything wrong to me. Just showing me love over love. I'm not going to refute him. Matter of fact, I can't wait to be with him. St. Polycarp. And uh, sure wasn't weak. Uh, EJ. Yes. So this one, it, it's unfortunate that the word in English has been chosen to be with such a negative connotations to it, the, the word meek. Yeah. Uh, the, in Aramaic, the word is mekicha. Yeah. And the word mekicha has actually, if, I mean, when you hear the word, it's implied that someone who is mekicha has he is a powerful entity, but chooses not to exercise and project power, but humbleness. And that's missing from the word meek. I don't think the word meek, it, well, it, it gotta, is gotta, really confusing. You're right. You, what, what, the translation that we have from Matthew's gospel, you got to remember, is the Greek version. The Aramaic is lost, but you were right. It would go back to the Aramaic. You know, so the version, I mean, the version we got, and so the English toward that is sometimes very bad, and the word we get is meek. You're right. Mekicha is very more important, but, it, it's, but that's what we're saying. We're saying it's not a sign of weakness or timidness. You know, it's a sign of gentle, humble, and you're saying someone who's strong, who puts on meekness for the kingdom of God, right? So, right, Johanna? Johanna, is that, that is, right? That is correct. That is correct. And great, I think great, it's a By the way, great way to add to the, the, the Bible study. Very, very nice. You know, yeah, and I think that's a very important distinction. Yeah. 
with this beatitude. Yep. And then that follows my example of St. Paul because St. Paul was not no weak person. Yeah. Father Solanus. Father Solanus. Was powerful and people would come to him and he would. He had an aura, a power, and the spirit. He would know. They would say, pray for my son if he lost. Yeah. Uh, and he would say, your son will be home. He'll be okay. Yeah. Or he would say, yes, let's pray because I'm not sure he's going to come back. Yeah. Right? But, yeah. but but on the other hand, he was the most humble person. Padre Pio would be like that. Exactly. Exactly. That's how it is. Very good. Number four. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Jesus here is telling us what is righteousness? It's true justice. It's living according to our baptismal promise. Blessed are those now who are, who are living according to their baptism. Blessed are those who are in grace. Blessed are those who look for Jesus and look toward Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus. Because nobody exemplifies righteousness. I fulfill all righteousness is Jesus. He was the only sinless person. Mother Mary, of course, you know, but as far as the God man, okay? Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. We could put Mother Mary as a perfect example. She not only was immaculate, she worked on it. The moment she found out that her cousin Elizabeth was pregnant, what did she use? She used her love and faith to run over there to help her. Right away. We must be people who long for true justice. We can't stand on the sidelines anymore. My God, how many times do us Christians stand on the sidelines? Oh, you know, these votes are all rigged. You know, no. We got a very, in Michigan, we got a very, I know in, in Chicago, you guys are in our very democratic blue, but we got a very dia, diabolical petition that's going to be voted on. That's going to allow the baby to terminate it the day after he's born. It's going to enshrine that we can never change the law. It's gonna allow parents to have nothing to do you know, with their children's decisions. Maybe even jail for them if we you know, tell them they cannot do this. It's downright diabolical. So are we in favor of God's righteousness by standing on the sidelines? I'm telling you, we have to be people like Mother Mary who put God first in everything. God forbid those people don't know that when they're going to vote, if they're going to vote for this. I'm telling you, they're, they're, they're siding with the devil. We must be a voice crying out in the world us, like John the Baptist, as he talked about Herod. And he said, it was not rightful that you can marry Herodias, your, Philip's wife. If Philip died, you can marry her. But Philip is alive and you're committing adultery. We should be like John the Baptist say, this law is wrong. This law is the worst thing. This law commits murder. We should be heralding it. You want the one who seeks righteousness is John the Baptist, another great example of this parable. I mean, this beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be called, they shall be satisfied. Those who are satisfied, satisfied, satisfied with God's mercy and justice. Jesus is also blessing those who show compassion for their fellow man. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Have a forgiving heart. Blessed are the merciful. St. Faustina tells us how much Jesus will forgive us when we act and accept his mercy and we trust in his mercy. One of the major problems Jesus had with the Pharisees he was more aligned, by the way, with his teaching with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because, but the main thing, 
one of the major obstacles, they did not have a heart of mercy. He said, did you not know the heart of the Lord is mercy? Mercy, mercy, mercy. How many Chaldeans walk around, Chaldeans say, walk around with a grudge in their hearts? I know a couple that didn't talk to their children because they didn't like who they married for 20, 30 years. Didn't even know their grandchildren. Then they received communion on Sundays. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that. They received communion on Sundays. Because they didn't agree. Or they had a mishap. Partners, brothers, friends had a mishap in their partnership. Don't talk to each other for years. Mercy, blessed are those. Favored are those who are merciful. The kingdom of God is yours. The sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Those who allow God to make them clean within. Jesus is blessing all who are pure in their entire being, not just an exterior pureness. Remember when I said we must be childlike? Favorite are those who are childlike because they have a pure heart. They depend on God for everything. They allow to be merciful. You know, kids can get in a fight for about a few seconds, to, you know, and then in two seconds later, they're best friends again. Yeah. How many real children have prejudice? How pure are our children when you look in their eyes? That's what Jesus brought a child and put him in the midst of the apostles. And so unless you become like this, not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Solanus Casey would be a, a great example of somebody pure of heart. Jen, uh, Peter, Solanus Casey would be somebody who really, even though, you know, he, he was not the smartest, you know, pupil for the priesthood. They didn't even let him give a homily when he said mass. But he didn't you know, harbor anger in his heart. Yeah, he didn't quit. He didn't quit. He was at the door. God used him to be, the, be at a door and listening to everybody's problems and prayers and, and, and petitions. This would be a beautiful example of uh, Blessed Solanus Casey. For those in the, in the Chicago area, we have uh, a blessed here by the name of Solanus Casey, um, who was, uh, did a tremendous amount of miracles uh, in our city. So if you don't know who I was talking, look them up. We just can't have exterior pureness. What I mean by exterior pureness is that we go to mass every day. You know, we pray the rosary. We, you know, we try to do the right thing. That's, you know, unless you have to have that relationship with God, unless you have to have a heart pure, open to God, you can do all these things and then, have a hardened heart. You're just doing them out of, you know, like, like Bishop Francis said the other day. How did he put it? You, you're doing them out of your, you know, your own personal will. You know, that word hypocr hypocrite, hypocrite. Jesus uses in John about you hypocrites, you know. Um, that means, like he said, Hollywood, an actor, putting on a new face. You know, I like the way the Chaldeans say, Yashakara Patha. You know, we can't do things and, you know, and be stoic like the Romans were stoic, you know, by going to mass and, and, and receiving the Eucharist and doing all the exterior things, but not having an interior love for Christ. The two have to come together. And matter of fact, the latter, the first one, the interior will help you be a lot better exterior. Don't we, and don't think it's going to be easy. Don't think it's easy. One of the prayers before communion for me, personally, I, I pray the prayer of St. Peter, give me more faith. I need more faith, Lord. I need, I, you know, in, in, in John 6 at the end of it, you know, you have all the answers. Where are we going to go? Do you want to leave too? He said, no, no, Lord, you have all the answers. I don't want to leave. I need you. 
I love that part of Peter's. I need you here. And I need you, Christ. But it did cross his mind. That's what Scott has left. Yeah. You know. yeah. But I need the Lord. We need to be childlike. Blessed are the pure of heart. Another good example would be um, uh, St. Bernadette of Lourdes. She had a very pure heart. They made fun of her, everything, and very pure heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus is blessing those who steer clear of useless quarrel, but more importantly, for those who stay clear of division. It's also a blessing for those who try to stay clear of conflict with God. Because true peace only comes from a contrite heart and reconciliation with God. Remember that true peace only comes from a contrite heart and reconciliation with God. Let me tell you guys one thing else. You cannot be a peacemaker if you do not evangelize. If you keep it, you're too You cannot be a peacemaker if you don't evangelize. The church, from its very nature, from its start, the word evangel, proclaim the good news to evangelize, evangelium, to go out there and tell Jesus is Lord. You know how many people, we all do it. It's nice when we you know, receive the sign of peace. Very nice that we give it to one another, you know. In the Chaldean, it's more solemn that you, you know, you grab and, but you know, later on we all say hi to one another. That's beautiful, but that's not the peace of this world. That does not mean we're going to have world peace. That is the most mistaken thing that people don't understand in the mass. That is the peace that gives us hope in the resurrection of the Lord. That peace is like Jesus says, it's not the peace of this world in the Latin rite. My peace is not the, that peace is that he has victory over Satan. That peace is that we're in the kingdom of God. We're on his side. We're with Jesus. We're in the reign of God. We're in favor because we're on God's side. I don't know about you guys, you know, in the Chicago area, we've had a bad football team. I know what it's to be on the losing side, but we got a pretty good one now. It's coming up. Hopefully it will continue. Yeah. You know, I know what it means to be on a losing side. That piece that we receive at Mass is mean we're on the winning side. And boy, I want to be on the winning side. I always, when I argue and something bothers me and Satan is attacking, I always say, Satan, get away from me. I belong to God. I have nothing to do with you. When he tries to tempt, I say it out loud sometimes. I'm like, get away from me. Be gone. And I always mention this. I'm a soldier of God. I might be bad. You know, he might tell me, oh, I look at you. you. You fall all the time. You got your temper. But I always say, I'm on God's side, buddy. Get away from me. Be gone. We cannot be a peacemaker if we're not evangelizing. And you cannot be a peacemaker if you follow division. Remember, unity leads to God. Division leads to Satan. Unity always belongs to God when we unify. Division belongs to Satan. No two ways about it. There is no true peace. I know a lot of atheists going around in this whole new business, and you know, promoted in colleges that you know you can find peace within yourself. You know, you can have a little bit of spirit. You don't have to have religion. You don't have to have God. No, no, doesn't work. We've been trying this trial for the last 50 years. You want to put on the news and see if it works? Put on the news for five minutes. See if this, this new era of your own spirituality is working. Doesn't work. Only peace comes from God and having a relationship with him and knowing him and loving him, loving him as your friend. Loving him as a dad. That's what Jesus taught us, to love God as a dad. To go out and play catch with him. 
go out and throw the football with him. Go out and tell him, you know, hey, but this little thing is bothering me. What do you think I should do about it? Let me do your will. I know you have the better answer than I do. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who continue to spread the gospel in season and out of season. In popular times and unpopular times. It is a blessing for all those who will be martyred for their faith. And for all who do not abandon their faith in difficult situations. Let's put it on the table. There's sometimes, you know, I was in the business world, or sometimes, you know, I wanted to avoid my religious side. I thought it wasn't cool. That's me. And I know scripture. But God has given me, you know, the talents. And I've squandered them. We all have. But blessed are those who are contracultural. Blessed are those who tell people, hey, this is not right. This killing the baby, you know, in the womb is not right. This baby had nothing to do with it. You were allowed to participate in God's creation by procreating and having children. But you were not allowed to enter the arena where God created the soul. This is murder. You have to have the strength in this beatitude to say, Lord, I have a relationship. I'm no longer going to accept stolen goods. I don't want anything stolen. I don't want I, you know. Uh, when I started having a better relationship with God, I'm just going to give you my own personal, like, you know, somebody will say, hey, you know, this was added to the truck, you know, can you give me 50 bucks for it? Say, no, I don't want it. Send it back. I don't want nothing to do with that. You know, when you do that, and you think when you were younger and I didn't have a really, when you do that, the next week, the, you know, the compressors were $3,000. They went out on you. Yeah. I'm, I, I believe me. When you want to, when you're rivaled for being persecuted, the seed of Christianity is from the blood of the martyrs. And us Chaldeans, we've been martyred for a long time in Iraq. We, Let's say, but we were not, you know, the favorite people in, in, in our own land. We should know about this. We should know about it. I even tell my, my wife and my children, I said, you know, there's this going around about this persecution and prejudice. I said, you don't know how much people were prejudiced in the 60s and 70s to us. How many people call us camel jackies? How many people said, you know... Uh, you know, hey, where did your dad park the flying carpet the other night? Uh, you know, uh, what kind of gas do you put in your camel? I, I got all those ugly looking jokes, you know, just, you know. Um, and those were minor. Those were minor, what, you know, what, what we saw, you know, in the 60s. And then they're going to tell us that, uh, you know, because of the color of our skin, you know, we're, we're, you know, systematically racist. Come on. Get a break. Give it a break. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for truth, for justice. Blessed are the Christians who stand up for the moral upright of the world. Blessed are those who can, you know, who tell, hey, you know, sexuality is meant between them in marriage. It's not outside of marriage. When we have that talk with our children. Yeah, yeah, I know that, Dad. No, no, you don't know it. Take it from me, I made mistakes. And they weren't that good. You don't have to make the same mistakes. They didn't get, they didn't get us anywhere. You think about John the Baptist and the lone boy crying out in the wilderness? Yeah. He's crying out to nobody. Yeah. He's like, listen, if nobody's going to listen, I'm still going to. I'm still going to cry out. Yeah. We have to preach the gospel. We have to evangelize. By the way, we... We're called to be countercultural. The culture, the culture wants the easy way. The, col the culture wants pleasure, material pleasure. I like Father Pierre's homily today. Sometimes life is good. You know, he told us uh, those who were at mass and those you know. He said, "There's a, you know, I, you know." He read the gospel that says, "You know, you know, to not be part of the world." disengagement but he said you know 
there's sometimes this gospel, you know, I, I read it and, I, and I'm frustrated because I like the world. I like the seasons. But then he says, you know, what this gospel is telling us is not, is not to depend on the world pleasures. He even said he likes pumpkin latte. I don't know why would somebody like something that sweet in the morning. Huh? <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like too much sweet drinks. So, Jay, what is the I mean, can you explain the difference between uh, eight and nine? Because they're very much the same. Oh, I thought it was. I thought it yeah. was. I thought it was because the blessed are those who are persecuted. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you do the right thing, you say the right thing, you don't stop spreading God's word, mm -hmm. all even if you're persecuted. All the apostles. What's that? All the apostles. Right. Yeah. right? But then the next one. Sorry. All true Christians are persecuted. Blessed are you when men were. All true Christians you. outside the circle of Christianity are persecuted. You know why? Because they don't know where we're coming from and they don't know where we're going. They don't know where we're coming from, where we came from, and they don't know where we're going. We came from the Father and we're going back to the Father. They don't know that. Pete had a good question. Is there much of a difference between Beatitude number eight and Beatitude number nine? They kind of overlap, but blessed are those men who rival you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. One reward will be great for suffering, maltreatment, and for, for one's unwavering fidelity to God. This is when they hate you because they hate Christ. Eight, one of eight is standing up for the unborn. That's your belief. You're standing for righteousness. Nine is people hate you because of your belief. No, they, they hate you because you're a Christian. They hate you because they hate you because you are a befriended Christ. Right. And eight would be also, you know, that you have, they hate you because you're living a, a gospel a life. They hate you because you're already in a state of grace. And by the way, this doesn't happen. Yeah. You don't have to be Christian. Some of the stuff. There are some atheists that are against against uh, abortion. Yeah. Well, say in, in yeah. eight, in eight, you're like, you're taking up the sword. And they're not the sword to take it up against you. Favored are you who built your trust in him. Favored are you who allows the Holy Spirit in your hearts. You remember when, when Jesus says, when you're going to be standing in front of the Sanhedrin and in front of death squads, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to come and speak for you. There was this Mexican priest that they were going to kill. You know, um, I forgot his name. I know his name. And when they started to shoot him, you know, he grabbed this Christ and, you know, and then the bullets were coming. He said, Cristo, Cristo, Cristo. Viva la Cristo. Long live Christ. That's martyrdom, you know. Um, There's a new good movie. I don't know if you've seen it. Father uh, Stu. Uh, Stu. Yeah. Did you see it? We mean Elias with yeah. the scene. Father Padre Pio's movie is coming out, uh, I think the 29th of September. That's, I'm really waiting for that one. Um, number nine. Build your trust in him. Teach his mercy. Even to those who hate you. That's a hard one for me. That's a hard one for me. I have to be honest with you. But Jesus says, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. Pray for you, the, the one. Jesus will send us the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit and when people rival against you. I remember one time when I was uh, doing pro-life ministry. And we, and we had a life chain. I took uh, the students to shrine. They were doing a life chain. And I remember, uh, yeah, there's not too many things I fear. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I don't back down from King Kong. I'm, I'm gonna, it's the way God built me. I'm not bragging or nothing. It's just, and, and it sometimes gets me in trouble. And, and uh, this guy, uh, we were coming down and uh, you know, we were just standing mining. We were praying the rosary. And his guy came up and gave me two fingers and he says, I'll beat you. And he tried to bring his car like, you know, you know, and, 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 and I said to myself, boy, don't come out of that car. You know, we're, and I, here I am with students, you know, 
uh, he really like attacked me viciously, you know, looked in my eyes and, you know, and um, that's when I need to rely on the Holy Spirit, not rely on my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how? What did you do? I look like he moved away. I didn't have to do anything. I, I know. You moved? <laughs> you know me, Pete, more than anybody. No, I know. No, I didn't move away. He was driving, but he tried to swerve his car and he gave me that look. It was a convertible. And he gave me the fingers and, you know, he like, you know, God won out, not me that day. But, you know, I, that's exactly being rival busted, you know. You know, I don't lose my time. <laughs> um, when we went to the to the Washington, D.C. marches, I didn't see too many people, you know, anti-protesting. I saw a few people, you know, but there were very few uh, back in the day, you know. So uh, I do remember uh, uh, somebody telling me, why do you have a cross in East Lansing on your, in your um, up there? Because I said, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. They text asked, me. They asked you why do you have a why is there a cross in front of your nose? Oh, at, at work. At yeah, the store. the store. Yeah. So, and I and I uh, always told people Merry Christmas or you know and you know one person said uh, you know I'm not Christian. I said well, you know, have a good blessed day. You know because I I said I, I'll always say Merry Christmas to people. You know, have a blessed you know Christmas and have, and and come back safe. You know. Um, even even small things like we weren't supposed to say Merry Christmas to people anymore. Isn't that sad? I mean, these are small, small things. Yeah. We couldn't make a small examples. Yeah. People said, why weren't you guys open? You know, it was a basketball game or something. And the Spartans were close in the playoffs. We were closed on it. It happened to fall one time when Easter was close to March. They said, no, we're close for Easter. Something more important than basketball. Store was closed. Closed on Christmas, closed on, I couldn't close any other day. And we closed on, you know, Christmas and Easter. Any questions about the Beatitudes? Now, this is the blueprint. What I mean by blueprint, if we live this, if we live these Beatitudes, then when you put them up with the commandments, the commandments are no, not a bunch of do's or do not, you know. You will worship the Lord thy God because you're going to have a relationship with him. Because you're not going to be high on yourself, high in spirit. And I don't mean the word high by getting, I mean, you know, being put up on yourself, being narcissistic. When we, you know, seek righteousness sake, when we are meek, we're going to love our parents. We're going to have a relationship because we're living a Christian life. We're going to keep the Sabbath holy because we love God. We're not going to steal anymore. We're not, we're going to go, steer away from lying and temptations of adultery. They're not going to be hard no more. The Ten Commandments will not become hard. It's because Christ told us, gave us the Beatitudes so that we could live the Ten Commandments very easily. It all starts with a relationship with Jesus and having his heart of mercy be open to us. And the two come together. Jesus said, I did not come to take one iota of the law away. Not one. But I came to bring the law to life. And the Beatitudes are the perfect blueprint how to live the Ten Commandments and if we happen to break them because we are human and we are weak. In the Catholic Church, you don't know how good you have it. We don't know because we can go to reconciliation and say, Father, you're speaking for God. I have sinned and I am heartily sorry for my sins. And I'm going to try like heck not to sin no more because I know it grieves the Trinity. I'm better than that. I know you ransomed me on that cross. And I'm going to try really hard not to sin no more. And still clear of sinning. But in our human nature, we're going to fall short. And we're going to go back to reconciliation and clean ourselves up. And we're going to get up and fight for another day. Amen? Amen over there in... Uh... Yes. Yeah. 
Any questions about any of the any of this uh, the beatitudes? Wasn't that a beautiful lesson? How God taught us how to be childlike and be children of God. I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing better than being Catholic because we have the fullness of God's church. We have the fullness of it. Last week, we talked about how beautiful baptism is. And today, we're talking about how beautiful the teachings of the divine teacher are for us. When he teaches us that I'm not putting a hard yoke on you. I'm easy. You just have to have a beautiful relationship. Have a relationship with And I'm going to tell you, it's not even enough to have a relationship with Jesus. Have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He will teach you how to pray. He will teach you what's right and wrong. Believe me, when you have a, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, when you offend him, you get hurt. When I get mad and lose my temper and stuff, it always I always have to put my head down and say, I blew it, didn't I? I'm talking to the Holy Spirit. I really blew it. I'm better than that. God, I'm better than that. Holy Spirit, I'm better than that. I hurt you. And I feel wounded. And I love that relationship. And then I pray that we can, you know, not be timid and be strong and stick up and be countercultural. Because there's no truth outside of Jesus. There's no truth. Nothing makes sense. Only in Jesus does it make sense. God bless you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mike. Mike's going to do final prayer, and he's got something to say about the rosary. Mike? Uh, thanks. Can you hear me? Are you there okay? Yes. Uh, thanks, E.J. Um, I just wanted to kind of make an announcement. Um, it, should, it should take just a couple of minutes. We are starting a rosary campaign called Million Rosary Drive with the goal to have million rosaries prayed, uh, hopefully more than that. Uh, this is to promote the devotion to the rosary and get more people to pray the rosary. Uh, the prayer, our prayer intention for this kind of this mission is for unity. We're praying for unity and conversion. And, um, you know, like EJ was saying earlier, of all the things that are happening in the world um, with abortion, with the homosexuality, is just our culture is quickly uh, running, um, uh, getting in trouble, uh, getting away from God. And so this is kind of an effort to get us back online and, and uh, to you know, get the, the faith uh, and get uh, all the churches to align and, and for for the faithful to pray to Our Lady so that uh, we know her, 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 how much she is powerful with God and how powerful the rosary is. And, and throughout, you know, um, years, throughout the centuries, her message has been very clear, whether um, at her apparitions at Fatima or Akita or La Salette and so on has always been the same as in to pray more to make sacrifices. So we're taking kind of this opportunity and and recognizing what's happening in the world and the and the, the need for the, the rosary to be to be prayed collectively and unitively by by all Christians really. So long story short, uh, <clears throat> Bishop Francis has given his full approval for this mission. He uh, actually asked us to launch it in October since October is the month of the rosary. And we are ca contacting churches to get them on board. We want to make this global campaign. Um, so we want to make it a global campaign and not just a Chaldean, something that we do throughout the Chaldean community. So we want to spread it out to other churches as well in the Latin Rite and even the Middle East uh, and spread it globally. So uh, we have a website that we have built. Uh, it's still being worked on, but uh, you can visit it. It's called millionrosarydrive.com. Um, sorry, was there a question? Put the link in our group chat. I will, I will. Um, and so, um, so I will, I will do that. And also, I wanted uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is, is that um, we need some help to spread the message, and we are looking for volunteers. So, um, if you feel in your heart that you're called to help please uh, contact me. Again, I will post the website uh, on the group chat and also my contact information. 
So if you um, uh, if you feel like you're called to to this mission, which I think it's super important for our time, uh, please contact me um, as soon as possible. We have a lot a lot of work to do, but even if you can spare a little time, that little time will will help fill in some gaps that we need. Um, it's it's a quite a big mission, but we have put our trust in the Lord to help lead this. It's not us doing the work; it's it's Him leading it really. Um, uh, yeah. May I say this something? This is Luke. Can I ask yes. a quick question? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. This is a great idea. And I'll be willing to help in any way I can, first of all. And then my question, though, I'm sure you're going to have like a, uh, something like a, a picture or something that you can share on social media between each other and on because uh, you know, on social media, that's the easiest way to communicate is you, you know, like a, a picture or something. I'm sure you're going to have that, hopefully. So that would help yes. also. Right. No, definitely. Yeah, we've we've also contacted ECRC, so we're working with them. Uh, they're helping us. I built the website, so I've um, I I spoke with Spencer. He has somebody who is who's a kind of website specialist who is working who I'm working with to help us kind of make the website more professional. We're also working on uh, doing a, a small video promo to kind of help speak to what we're doing to, to this mission. Mike, are you going to, uh, just a quick question. I know my wife likes to pray the rosary with Father Simon. Are you yes. going to have somebody saying, she said she concentrates more when she prays the ro rosary with somebody. Uh, is there gonna be like a web where, where somebody will be leading the rosary? My wife? Uh so everything is being developed now. We're we're um, it's it's we haven't thought about it to be honest with you, but I think it's a great idea for sure. One of the things we do have on the website is a, a counter. So when you go and pray, you can go on the website and and add in your your rosary prayer so it counts towards the the goal. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, and um, I think we can definitely add that and and have a sort of a, a video of the rosary because you know people this if this is going to be whether it's national or international people are going to be praying it at different times so we could just add a a, a video or um, something of that sort so if somebody wants to pray along they can do that yeah. I I have, have, I I have, have, go ahead is it the same one that mother of god posted on the social media and the nuns so it's a little different campaign. So I, I originally contacted Bishop Francis and the bishop really liked the idea. And I told them, I said, before I approach the priests, I want you to mention it to them. So he mentioned it at their last meeting. And it, is, it seems to me that uh, Father Perrin kind of took the idea and he ran with it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's a it's a little different goal, but I, the ultimately I think we have the same intent. You know, his his mission or his um, he's doing this to um, uh, what was it? I forgot what his uh, his mission was. Is his because intent. I saw one mo mother of God posted it, and I saw one the nuns um, sister Angelica posted it. So I don't okay. know if it's both the same or it's like each one is different. Yeah, so I, ideally, to, to be honest with you, when we started it, we wanted to have one common mission, one common goal across the churches, because unity is important. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a lot of disunity within the church. Uh, and that these are these are signs that the devil has, as uh, Pope Paul VI said, that the devil would enter the church, and we're seeing that discord within the church. So we're praying for unity. That was our one of our mission. And then conversion, because conversion is needed across the board, whether you're talking about abortion, homosexuality, just in general, right? So that was our mission. But uh, it, it, it sounds, because I'm, again, I, um, I found out just recently that Father Perrin is doing this for um, uh, vocations, for that intent. It's perfectly fine. I don't think anybody can go wrong by praying the rosary. So if there's a slightly different mission, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still fine. Uh, we're still going to pursue our our goal um we're planning on go going on the radio as well and mentioning it so we can get more more churches i've spoken to rafi uh, okay who... a question can you give me my mom always plays the rosary mm -hmm. i can like uh sign him, her in mm -hmm. 
and count that rosary with you guys if you don't mind but yeah. i don't have any information of you would you please give me i'm yeah. not in the group chat for some reason oh, you're not. i don't know okay yeah. um is your is that your number eight nine one mike yeah. if you go to million rosary drive it's the very first one that comes up We'll talk about this more next week. Mike, you want to lead us in prayer? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, can I say we something? And we're going to talk about it, and we, and we really need to pray the, this, the jump on this campaign and pray for the, the ballot to be defeated and, like you said, unity and get us back to our, our true Catholic faith, not Catholic light. Go on, lead us in prayer. Sure, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the many blessings in our lives. Today, especially, we give thanks to the gift of our Mother Mary and in her role as, as she assists and guides us in this life towards her son. We ask, Lord, that you give us the necessary grace to be her disciples, to faithfully serve at her feet. We are reminded in the gospel of her power, powerful role to, to crush under her feet Satan with the rosary as our weapon. We ask that you help bind our hearts to her heart and answer her call to pray and trust in her motherly and unconditional love and to serve her. As we pray, one Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed are and blessed is thy name, Jesus. Holy Mary, pray for us now Amen. St. Matthew, pray for us. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Safe day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.